Good morning, good morning, and welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are joining me for the very first time, my name is Dahlia, and I have been sharing from the wonderful book of John. Yes, yes, yes. Now, on this channel, we share on Mondays and on Fridays, where Friday is prayer time. Join me on Fridays because we are talking about how to fast. This is a How to Fast series on Friday, so join me. It's an amazing series, and we need to learn how to fast and to fast the right way. You want answers from God? Oh, my goodness. Join me on Fridays. You will get answers to your prayers after you hear the teaching on how to fast. There was also a How to Pray series before that, so when you put those together, you will see it's explosive. But let's get into the book of John because it is such a wonderful chapter. I'm telling you, chapter 14 is one of the foundational chapter in the entire Bible. I mean, Jesus is just talking up a storm. He's teaching his disciples wonderful things, wonderful promises that are also available to us and are applicable to us. So this is a chapter that you need under your belt. So thank you for joining me. Let's get right into it. In the last uh, chapter, we talked about, uh, we're in chapter 14, so I'm sorry. In the last verses, you know, we talked about um, Jesus and the Father being one, not letting your heart be troubled because Jesus was going away, but he wasn't leaving them like orphans. You know, and um, everybody was getting their panties in a bunch or their, I don't know what they call the dress, their robes in a bunch because Jesus was leaving and Philip had an issue and Peter had an issue because, you know, it's just like any love relationship when the person is leaving. Like if you watch the previous message, you know, you don't want that person to go. You want to be with them. Even when you're in love with your spouse or significant other, if they're going even to work or away, you're going to miss them. So it's the same thing, but they had a love for Jesus and they were going to miss him. And then when Jesus was talking to them in verse 12, he says, verily, verily, I say unto you that the works that I do Greater works will you do. And the greater works there wasn't talking about the quality or, you know, the type of work that they were going to do. The greater work was talking about the quantity as well as the length of time. Jesus, remember, only had three years in ministry on earth. He's now going away. So going away now, he's going to leave us, and we've been here for decades. So the quantity is bigger, and the time span is longer, because not only have we gone through decades, but we've gone through centuries. So it is a bigger and a greater work because of the time span, the time period, because we've been through centuries we're in the 21st century right now. So the work is greater and the quantity is greater. So the time span is greater and the quantity obviously is greater. Why? Because there, there are many of us and we are included in this greater works because we are doing the work. So now we're going to go from verse 13 to verse 21. I'm going to read a little bit and then we're going to talk about it like we always do. Verse 13 in John chapter 14, it says this, fasten your seatbelts, because this is exciting. I keep saying this, you don't need to go to no prophet and no sorcerer, no medium for a word from God. So here is your answer, because I've been saying it and saying it. If you would meditate on the word of God and read the word of God, you'll see. God has the answers for you. It's in the asking. That's all. Verse 13. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified. I want to read that again. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And it's speaking to us because it's applicable to us. He said, and whatsoever now he was talking about the greater works so the, it's it's not concluded he says greater work are you going to do because i'm going to go to my father 
So when we go out to ministry, when we go out to do the work of the Lord, whatever we ask, what does that mean? When we come and we ask him and we're in ministry or even in our own personal life, when we ask, because he didn't just limit it. It wasn't limited to just that. Notice he says, whatsoever you shall ask in my name. So it wasn't a limited asking. Why? He says, so that my father will be glorified. Now, remember when Jesus was in the earth, whatever he did, he says, I do this so that the father will be glorified. You know, that's what he would say, that the father will be glorified because that is the ultimate goal is to glorify God in the earth. We are not called here to glorify ourselves or some dumb title. That's irrelevant. We are here to give glory to God in all that we do. So he says, and this is a new promise, in prayer. This is why I keep saying prayer is important. You have to pray. If you don't pray, how will you know? You have a right to pray. He has given you the privilege of prayer. But the thing is, a lot of believers, they don't want to pray. I've had um, one of um, our ministers was, you know, giving a report and this particular person wanted to keep coming for prayer. Oh, what did God say? And they would come the next time. What, what did God say? And she says, wait a minute. I'm not no, no sorcerer. What, you, what is this? Go home and pray. This person didn't want to pray. This person wanted to engage this minister in habitually showing up and calling on the phone for prayer all the time, sometimes three, four times a day. That's not right. You have to pray. You have the privilege to pray. If there's breath in your body, you can pray. You don't need to be calling people to pray. Now, you can call somebody to help you pray if you're down, if you're, you know, feeling by yourself. Yes, you can call somebody to agree with you in prayer. But when that is all said and done, you still have to pray in your closet, in your private time to God. It's okay to pray in groups. Yes, we have corporate prayer. We have, you know, cell prayers where individuals, but then there has to come a time when it's a one-on-one -on -one with you and God because he knows what you need. And so he says, ask what else, whatsoever you ask in my name. The name is like the signature on the check. If someone writes you a check and you go to the bank to present the check and there's no signature, you know, the bank is not going to cash the check. It has to have a signature. So the name of Jesus is not only the signature, but it's the authority. It's the authority and the power that opens up for the Father God to say, hold on, they've got my attention. And then whatever you ask, then it says that he will do it because then God gets the glory. In verse 14, he says this, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So he repeats the same thing. He repeats it twice. So what I'm not understanding is why aren't more believers asking God for things? Now, if you watch the How to Pray series, you would see the answer to that because in the book of James, it says that they ask and it uses the word amiss. They ask amiss. And what it means is wrong motive. They come to God and they ask with the wrong motive. When you ask in the name of Jesus, you have to ask according to his principles. You have to ask according to his standards. You cannot come to the Lord asking for someone's wife or someone's husband. You cannot come to God asking him for illegal things. He's not going to do that because that's not the principle. That's not, that's not who he is. You have to ask according to who he is. He represents the kingdom of God. And you have to ask for what's in the kingdom of God. And in the book of 1 John, it says, 
This is the confidence that we have. I want you to listen to the word in 1 John. He says, this is the confidence that we have that if we ask anything according to his will, we have the petition that we ask for. He's going to do it as long as it's according to his will. Now, don't use prayer and fasting because I'm taught I did the prayer and I did the fasting series and people think they can use prayer and fasting to twist God and to change his mind. He's not going to change his mind because if this pen doesn't belong to you and if this pen wasn't slotted for you, you could chew on a piece of iron like a bubble gum. He's not going to give it to you because it doesn't belong to you. And that's the issue in many of the, the churches and the lives of the believers. They like to ask for things that don't belong to them. You have to know the will of God and you ask. He's not going to keep anything from you. And as we go through the book of John, you're going to see Jesus is saying, the father knows. The father knows what things you have need of. So God knows what you need and he only gives good gifts to you. He's not going to give you anything that's not good for you. You see? So when you ask in his name, you ask in his authority. So if I give you a check and I sign the check for $10,000, you can take it to my bank and they have to cash it once they verify it. Hold on, let me see. Uh -uh, that's her signature. And they'll cash the check for you. It's the authority in his name. So he says, ask, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Verse 15. Watch this now. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, what you got to say about that? If you love him, you will keep his commandments. Now, many people say, oh, but we're not perfect we make mistakes and don't let me have to go there again there's a difference when you make a mistake there's a difference when you kind of fall into sin you know you get trapped and you you make a mistake and you you you, you back up and you you know you get weak we all have been in those situations but what he's talking about is those people who habitually do things they do it this month then they do it they do it they do it and they won't stop and instead of repenting about it what they do, they make excuses about it. They make excuses for doing what they do. Oh, well, when I was, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I, you know, she walked by and, you know, her skirt was, you know, kind of tight. So I looked up and they come up with all these excuses. You cannot create any excuse in the book for adultery. You can't. There is no excuse for it. Because if there's an issue, God give, gave us a way in our marriages how to handle our marriages if there are certain issues. You can't take it upon yourself to go out to go commit whoredom and then trying to justify your whoredom. There's no excuse for that when you enter into the institution of marriage you have to then follow what the institution outlines for you to follow in that marriage but people become selfish people become lustful and evil and wicked and they make excuses he said if you love me keep keep my commandments it's just that simple now when he says ask anything in my name and I'll do it. This does not mean that you use the name of Jesus like a magic wand, you know, rub the genie belly. And you cannot use the name of Jesus like an incantation. An incantation is like, you know, when you go to those weird things, voodoo worship, you know, they will chant chant certain things to bring certain spirit it's like that movie um i didn't watch it um i think it's called candy man 
Candyman or something, and they, and they would say the name over and over and over, and then the, the, the ghost would appear, something like that. You cannot come and with vain repetition with the name of Jesus. And the second thing I want to encourage you is do not take the Lord's name in vain. A lot of people take the Lord's name in vain, and you cannot do that. That's not, God does not like that. That's a sin. So when people are cursing, they take the name of the Lord in vain. And when they're swearing, they take the Lord's name in vain. You cannot do that. Don't do that. Because this name has power. There is power in the name of Jesus. But you see, we don't respect the name. And a lot of Christians don't respect the name. So when they go to use the name, when they go to call on the name, it seems it seems like there's no power. That's because they have no respect for the name. So all of that is out. You have to reverence the name of the Lord. So ask. You don't need to go to no prophet and no uh um, palm reader for answers you get into prayer and you ask the lord and he will answer you he said i will give it to you i will give it to you you don't have to steal from people you don't have to beg and borrow ask the lord he'll give it to you he will make a way verse 60 now jesus switches up and he goes into verse 16 and now he's going to promise because remember he said he was going away and he says, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you that you went, that where I am, you will also be. But he says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. Don't let your heart be troubled. I'm not leaving you like orphans. I got something for you. You're not going to be an orphan or abandoned. And so here is the answer. In verse 16, he says, and I will pray the father and he will give you another comforter that he might abide with you forever. Watch this. I keep telling you, you don't need to ask no palm reader and lying prophets for anything. Verse 17, he says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Watch this. So Jesus is going to ask the father to send us a comforter. And he says that he will abide with you. And that means to dwell with you or to live with you. He says, now he's telling you what the comforter is and who he is because the comforter is a person. And he says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it see him not. You see that? It's a person. He says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither know him because they know him not. Why? For he dwells with you and he shall be in you. Oh, glory to God. So he's talking about a person, the person of the Holy Spirit. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send another. And what that means is like a paraclete implies that it's a person who is going to come alongside you and be in you. Because he's going to dwell or abide in you. So you're not going to be alone. You're never alone. And it's not spooky now. So don't go get spooky or cast for the ghosts and ghostbusters. No. It will be a per the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be that inner man that's within. And he's going to illuminate and enlighten and, and walk alongside you like a paracletos, like next to you. It's a person. And he says, the world cannot see him. So don't expect the unsaved and the ungodly people to understand that God has given us a comforter to go with us, to be with us. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Oh, my goodness. I want you to take this word, meditate on it. So even though Jesus is away, he says, I'm not leaving you comfortless. I will come to you. How is he going to come to you? You have to ask him to come. You see, people are like, well, why doesn't he stay? Listen, there are some people who go to places and people's home where they are not invited. I wasn't raised that way. You don't go to people's home and go to someone's party or wedding or funeral where you were not invited. That's just really unclassy if that's a word it really isn't you don't do that 
But the Lord, the reason why we have prayer is that we have to pray. We have to invite God into our situation. We have to invite him. Just like the way we ask him into our hearts as our Lord and Savior, we have to initiate. He will pull us. Because you see, before the foundation of the world, he already called us and chosen us. So we think we're choosing him. But no, he chose us. And then he woos you. He pulls you in. He draws you in, you know. Oh, he just lures you in because he loves you. But you ultimately have to then decide, yea or nay. And he will continue to woo you until you say yes, you know. But when you do, you have to invite him in. You still have to invite him him in and prayer is inviting God in your circumstances inviting him to interfere in your life you want his purpose you want his will you want his way so you have to invite him in so a lot of times people don't want to pray because they don't want God in their circumstances because they already know what the answer is going to be so they don't pray because they don't want God they don't want to hear that no there are some people who they just don't want to hear a no you know because the world is full of narcissistic people right now and they are spreading like wildfire in the church just narcissists you can't tell them no because it's like they'll find a way and they'll rephrase and rephrase until they get what they want you know mm -mm. prayer is not that prayer is inviting God in your situation so that you can know what his purpose and his perfect will is for your life and then when you know it's perfect will for your life you'll be in agreement with it but a lot of people don't want to pray because they don't want the answer because they know what the answer is going to be so they do and then when it crashes and burn they want the preacher to come with the shovel and the axe to get them out and when god doesn't get them out quickly enough they blame him you know, it's funny how people who don't go to church, don't pray, don't serve God. Let there be a hurricane. Let there be an earthquake. Why did God let there be an earthquake? Why did God do this? It's like, okay, why? When was the last time you had a conversation with God? Because if you did, you could have asked him and he would have told you why. So he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So Jesus will come to you and don't go saying, oh, I saw Jesus in the, in my toast. I saw Jesus in the tree. No such thing. He will come to you in the spirit of truth. He will come to you in a form. It's not visible, but he will come to you in all, you know, it's like sometimes me personally, other pastors have explained, but me personally, I don't like to share like, you know, when the Lord shows you something or reveals something because then people will walk away with that mental frame and then they will expect God to do it that way. Don't limit God because he comes in different ways to you. But the bottom line is, and the key is, he said he will come to you. So don't put him in a box saying, well, how is he going to come? Is he going to come by a bird, a dove? No, 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 no. He will come and he will come. I can tell you that, that he will come to you. He won't. And you'll know that it's him. I love the story when Jesus rose from the dead and when um, he passed by the disciples and they didn't know it was Jesus, right? And then when he left, the Bible said like he left and he kind of touched them and they said, oh, didn't our hearts burn? Because they sensed his presence and there is a presence about God that when he comes and he speaks into your heart, you will know and you will feel different. It's, it's, it's something that words are just not enough to express, but just know be assured that he will come. He will not leave you alone. Verse 19. Now he says, yet a little while and the world see it me no more, but you will see me because I live, you live also. You see that? He says, because I live, you live also. If you think of Psalm 150, the last verse, when the psalmist was saying, he says, let everything that hath breath Praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Jesus says, You will see me because I live, you live also. 
So because he lives, we live also because we're in him and he is in us, meaning in our spirit. Remember, we're spirit, soul, and body. He says, and at that day, you shall know that I am in the father and you in me and I in you. So we're one. Remember, we were made in the image and likeness of God. When Adam sinned, that broke off that relationship. So now God had to come another way to come back into man, you see. And so he says here that you will know that you and I, I am one with the Father, and then I'm in you and you're in me. So we're one with God. So he's restoring that broken relationship that Adam did in the garden. Now we are restored to our oneness with God when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior in our lives. Verse, he says this, verse 21. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. So in other words, a lot of people want God to manifest. They want God to do this and do that. But yet they don't offer God any parts of them. When I taught how you can, how to fast pray series and how to fast series, I said, people like to come to God with your laundry list. And then they give him the laundry list and they walk away into the sunset, never looking back. You have people who go to church on Sunday and they would go to church on Sunday and they never open their Bible or pray until they get to church the following Sunday. And then when trouble comes, they want God. No, listen to what he says. He says, if you love me and you keep my commandments, it's the one who loves me, right? The one who loves me will be loved of my father. And I will love him and I will manifest to him. So he will manifest himself to you and he will manifest himself to you. However, you, according to however you are, he will manifest himself to you. So don't look for a formula. I don't want to get too deep because people tend to want to get a formula. There is no formula because he's God. He can come, you know, when the prophet, <laughs> when the prophet got angry at God, Elisha, and he was sitting there and the Lord was speaking to him. And he go, he was arguing with God and he heard the wind and he was like looking for God and he goes, he's not in the wind. And then God sent something else and he goes, he's not in the earthquake and he's not in the wind. Where is he? You know, he was fussing, but then he realized that God was in the wind. He wasn't here, but God was a still small voice, a still small voice. And my pastor used to say, it's a still small voice, but it's so loud, you can't not hear it. And he will speak to you in that still small voice to give you direction. So you will not be comfortless and you will not be alone. But when you love God and you put him first and you pray and you ask him, he will manifest himself to you and you will know when his presence is near. Sometimes he'll just sweetly wake you up and you, you'll sense like, oh, I'm going to pray. You'll get up in the morning and you'll find yourself started thanking God, thanking God, because the Bible said the spirit knows our infirmity and the spirit knows what to pray for. So the Holy Spirit within you will know what you should pray for. He sees the danger ahead. And so he will, you know, he will like wake you up to pray and you find yourself praying or praising God because something is getting ready to happen and the Holy Spirit is getting you ready. And so all of a sudden you find yourself singing a song. People think that singing a song is singing a song. No, singing a song is worship. Singing a song is praise. Singing a song can be a prayer because the psalm is songs. And you'll get up and you'll find yourself a song might drop in your spirit. But that song is a message. It's a message. And so when you're in tune with the spirit, when you study the word and you study the word and you pray and you seek the Lord, you begin to understand how he speaks to you. You begin to understand how he comes to you. He comes to me in such in the sweetest ways ever. 
in the sweetest way. And the other thing that he does is sometimes when in my prayer time, when I go to pray in my prayer time and I'm praying and I'm praising the Lord, he will just put brother so-and-so in my heart or he'll put sister so-and-so. And then I find myself just praying for this person. And then a couple of days later, I'll get a phone call or there is an announcement that so-and-so and this and that. And so he speaks to us and he comes to us and he shows us things to come. But you have to have a relationship with him. I can't go to my neighbors and knock on the door and, hey, hey, can I come spend the night at your house? They don't know me. They don't know me. I can't go to the White House and be like, yo, knock, knock, can I come in? No. You have to have a relationship with him. When you have a relationship with Jesus, you can ask. That's why he says, ask me anything. I'll do it. I'll do it. Why? Because the Father will be glorified. Heaven will rejoice. But if you love me, make sure you keep my word. You keep my commandments. So you can't be a stranger just showing up at someone's door with your suitcase asking, hey, can I come, you know, give me a room? I want to bunk with you. They're going to call the cops on you. So you have to have a relationship with him. You have to keep his word. You have to love him. And when you love him, you will keep his word. When you see some of those people out there talking about, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, and they're living in sin. You see, people like to talk about the church, talk about sin, 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 sin. You cannot live in sin habitually and think that God is going to listen to you. It's, it doesn't work like that. You have to come into the kingdom of God. That's why in Matthew 6, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his way of doing things. And then all these things will be added unto you. In other words, I'll give you all these things. You don't have to go seeking after these things, but I'll give them to you. So you have to have a relationship with him for you to be able to do verse 13 and verse 14, which is to ask anything and he'll do it. And verse 21, where he said, I will come and I'll manifest myself to you. He'll reveal himself to you. So you have to seek the Lord. So here is the promise and the privilege of prayer that whatever you ask, He'll do it, but you've got to ask in his name. You've got to come in his name. His name is the authority. His name is the power. His name is the key to your answered prayer. You ask in his name, but then when you ask in his name, make sure you ask according to his principle and according to his guidelines. He'll give you anything in the kingdom of God. You can't come and ask him to kill somebody or beat up your neighbor or, you know, get rid of somebody. That's not his nature. You ask according to his nature. Oh, because somebody said something funny to you or somebody look at you funny. Lord, get rid of her. Get rid of her. He's not a mafia. No, you ask according to his principles, according to his kingdom, the kingdom of his Christ. And there's so much in the kingdom of God you can ask, so much you can get, and so much that is good for you. Because remember, God says, I know what you have need of, even when you tell me I already know. So be encouraged today. God is speaking to you, but make sure you have a relationship with him. Make sure that you keep his word. And if you make a mistake, he's not going to knock you off the line and say, go to the back of the line. No, like I say throughout all of my messages, it's simple. You make a mistake or, you know, you fail. You fail because we've all failed. All you have to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it because you see, he sees your heart. He sees your heart. So if you fall off the bandwagon, say, Lord, I'm really sorry. Sometimes you make a mistake because you're with the wrong group and you kind of got swept into certain things. And you come out, you say, Father, I didn't mean to do that. I'm so sorry. I didn't know how to say no. I didn't know how to get out. I won't do it again. And that's it. God will just be like, it never happened. But just because God gives us grace doesn't mean that you take advantage. And that's what a lot of believers do. And these grace, grace churches and mercy, mercy, love, 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 love. God is love. Jesus is love. God loves everybody. Oh, he loves everybody. Mm -hmm. He loves everybody. He loves the world. But he don't like sin. And he doesn't play with sin. And he doesn't harbor sin. And he doesn't keep sinful people in his kingdom. But he loves you though. 
So don't fall for that lovey-dovey stuff. You cannot sin habitually and think that you're in a relationship with God. He said, if you love me, keep keep my commandments. I like what the apostle says, because when the apostle gets into it, he gets down in the nitty gritty. You know, in the book of Ephesians, he says, look here, no whoremonger, no fornicator, no idolaters, no, um, um, no idolaters, no, um, um, what do you call it? No thief, no liars will have any part in the kingdom of God. None of these people, if you are an idolater, some people, they idolize other people, their children, their husband, their spouse, they're idolatry, they're into idolatry, materialism, they're in the idolatry because they love things and money more than God. And he says, all these people, adulterers, fornicators, you know, whoremongers, liars, thieves, wife beaters, all these people, he says, you have no part in the kingdom of God. So you can't do these things and then be like, God is love. He loves everybody. No, you're on your way to the downstairs abode. So when you come into the kingdom of God, when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have to have a relationship with him. Keep his word. If you miss it, get up, wash your face. And start over again and ask him to forgive you sincerely and ask him to give you strength not to do it again. And if you fall again, say, Lord, this seemed to be a weakness for me. Help me, God, help me. And he will give you strength. But keep coming to him. Don't not come to him. And don't sin and be guilty and walk away from the kingdom of God. Don't do that. There are people who habitually sin who don't care about God. Those people are different. But if you, some people have a little weakness, some people, it takes them a little bit of while to get out. Like, for example, somebody who smokes, you know, and when they come to Christ, sometimes they have to break that habit. And so it takes them a while to break away from the smoking or if they're used to, if they're used to having, you know, a glass of wine or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever it is that you have to stop because he'll tell you, he'll just put in your heart not to do that anymore and so some people if they smoke it will take them a while because it's a habit and so they have to break the habit so they'll say okay lord help me help me help me he'll help you but then maybe you know you're in a crowd and you smell the cigarette smoke and you go oh and you pop one and you're like oh my goodness i'm so sorry god will help you so don't run away or walk away be because you have you know a particular issue bring it to him Put it on the altar and put it there and put it there. And, you know, if it takes you a while to shake it, that's all right. As long as you stick with God, God would stick to you. But don't walk away because he has given us the privilege and promise of prayer that if you ask anything in his name, he will do it. Just ask. It's all about the asking. You don't have to ask any prophet, any palm reader, anything. You ask God and he says, whatever you ask, I will do it. Amen. Oh, I hate to stop here, but I'm going to stop here because I'm telling you, this is a wonderful chapter. We're going to continue on to this chapter. Come back. I'm telling you, the book of John is wonderful. Know that Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. And now he's saying, listen, this is why, because I'm not leaving you comfortless. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to be in you. I'm going to walk alongside you and I'll be in you. And the father is in me and I'm in you and you're in me and you can ask what you want. You see, once he He's in you and he lives in you. You can ask what you want and then he'll tell you, but just be prepared for him to tell you the answer and he will tell you always what's good for you and God knows what's best for you. You've got to trust God, trust him. I've been in church a long time and see people not trust God and, and, and things will go nice. You know, the marriage will go nice for the first six months or the first year. And then after that, it's just downhill. It was just like a crash and burn. So don't try to go after things and people and places that God did not put in your path. Whatever his will for you, it will be right. And it will be right. Solomon says it this way. He says, the blessings of the Lord makes you rich 
and he doesn't add any sorrow to it. When God gives you a blessing, when God gives you a husband, a car, a house, a land, a job, he does not add any sorrow to it. There's not going to be no sorrow. Are you going to have trials? Yes. Somebody's always going to try to come to unearth you, but there will be no sorrow. In other words, it's not going to cost you. You're not going to be in pain. You're not going to be sorry you had it or sorry I married him or sorry I married her, you know, because it's a good thing that God gives. He gives good gifts. So there's no sorrow. There's no pain to it. And there's no pain to maintain it. And there's no pain to keep it because it will be kept because God gave it to you. And what God gives, he doesn't take back. And there's no pain, no sorrow, no grief with it. You're never going to cry over a gift that God gave you. If God gave you a house, you're not going to cry and say, oh, I can't pay the mortgage. I can't pay the light. No. When he gives you that house, he's going to provide for the mortgage, the water bill. He's going to provide for the light bill, the gas and the food. He's never going to let you sit in that house in sorrow. But if something is going on in your life, cry out to him, seek his face, examine your life and make sure that you are obeying God because he doesn't add any sorrow to it. Whatever he gives you, he gives you a wife. He's going to give you a good wife. The Bible said he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtain favor from God. They always seem to leave that part out. When a man finds a good wife, God is going to give him with the wife favor. You know what favor is? That's grace, unmerited favor, unmerited goodness. That wife is going to come with favor attached to her. But you've got to get a wife from God. You've got to get a wife from God. You can't go out there and you know what a lot of these Christian preachers, they want to be a power couple. So they go out there and they want to marry another celebrity because you know, put them on TV for five minutes, they feel like they're famous. And so they want to go marry somebody famous. And then when the marriage break down, they come back and they try to spin it. Well, you know, this and that. Get out of here. You were out of God with God's will when you married that woman because you wanted to marry a movie star or somebody famous or somebody who sings because you wanted to be a power couple and be and feel like you're on high because you're a narcissist. That's what it was. You didn't want that little sister that God brought in and put before you because you feel like, oh, she's ordinary. And a lot of these preacher men, they want the silicone, silicone lips silicone boobs, silicone butt, silicone everything. And they don't want that nice sister who can cook and clean, who, who, who can take care of your children, who knows the word of God and who will love you like you've never been loved before because they're infatuated and in loss. And when they pick up loss, they pick up daggers and knives and needles. And when it doesn't work, they come on the YouTube and they cry. Wah, 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 and want sympathy from people. No, you are out of the will of God. When God gives you a wife, baby, he gives you a good thing and favor comes with it. That woman is not going to get up and leave you and then get on YouTube with another man in your face. And you're the preacher. And you talk about, oh, God told me that this is my wife. God told me that this. And the woman ain't even saved. She's not even walking according to the will of God and you see these pastors they're marrying these unsaved women who don't have the spirit of the Lord in them but they want to be a power couple and then we got to sit here and watch it and everybody got something to say well they are going to have something to say because you were out of the will of God so if you love God, keep his commandment. And if you want something, ask and he'll do it. But when he does it, receive it, receive it. Don't come and then when he gives it to you, you don't want it because you want what you choose. No, God knows what you need. He knows what you need. He'll only give good gifts to you. Trust him. Why go down the road in agony and frustration because you did the wrong thing? Trust God. He knows what you need. Ask him. And when you ask him, be prepared to take his answer. And know that God knows what's best for you. Lust and beauty is temporary. Because you know the old saying, you can have a pretty woman, but when she opens her mouth, you're like, Lord, have mercy. You can have a handsome man, but when he opens his mouth, you run. Mm -mm. You want somebody good that God approve. God approve. A God approve home a God approved job because he adds no sorrow to it. So he says, ask me anything, whatever you ask, I'll do it. He'll do it, but he's not going to give you something that's outside of his will, outside of his nature, outside of his principles. You're going to ask according to his will and he will do it. Oh, 
it's so good. Thank you so much for watching. Be encouraged and ask, only ask. And listen, let God give you direction. You don't need nobody telling you anything else. Amen. Thank you for watching. Go with God and continue to be a blessing.